Good morning. You know, what we're experiencing here this morning is right in harmony with the advice and counsel that Ellen White gave. She says that we need to dispense with the sermon <laughs> and hear the testimony of the Lord through the, to the faithfulness of his people. And that's what we've heard today. And we're not through yet. There's another testimony that's sitting in the back of the church that are going to come forward and to share their story of God's faithfulness. I see them nodding their head, but I'm nodding mine too. <laughs> Is it yes or no? Okay, yes, okay. Can we tell the story? Okay, come on up. It's very important for us to be reminded of God's faithfulness. God is faithful. And we were blessed in our Sabbath school class to hear many testimonies and stories of God's faithfulness. And so you're just going to get a sample of one of them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just take That's us. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm a real estate agent. No one left. That's a really good start. <laughs> uh, I got back into the game a few years ago, um, and it was purely by God's will that, that I did get back into the game. It was just a, an opportunity. And it popped up and we took it. And uh, one of the decisions I made, and a lot of you here realize that um, I've been recently baptized with my two beloved children. My wife beat us by a, a long time. Uh, and one of the decisions I made getting back into real estate was that we were going to do, only going to work on Sundays. We weren't going to work on Saturdays. And then anybody who knows anything about real estate, it all happens on Saturdays. So it was a massive leap of faith. And... Um, it was, it was actually an amazing experience. It really was a leap. I had no idea how it was going to go. And obviously, I have to have the, my, my clients, my vendors' best interests at heart. And uh, so I put my, put my uh, life and my family's future in God's hands. And uh, I'll let my wife take it from there. Um, so he... <laughs> No dinner tonight. Um, so, um, <laughs> so we, um, he made a choice um, not to work on Sabbath. He made a choice not to do any open homes or auctions on Saturday. So it was a really big leap of faith. Um, we didn't know how many people were going to rock up on Sunday. So the very first open he had, um, he rented a crowd, which was his family, um, so we said, we'll be there uh, to support you. Um, we'll be there, not right on time, but we'll be there about 10, 15 minutes late. And we'll just be there for, your, for support. Um, so we rocked up down the street and um, we noticed the entire street was covered with parked cars all the way down. It was a fairly long street. And we thought, oh my goodness, it must be a party or there must be you know, a lot of people with second, third cars. So we kept on driving around the block and he kept on going all around the blocks. And I went, my goodness. This is... So we did a, a, a loop and went down the road again. And we're like, OK, um, try and find the house. And they're like, kids are OK. And we're looking, looking. And it was sort of tucked back a little bit and one of the kids said oh my goodness mum look at all the people and I'm like what and we sort of the people just went all around and down because there was a lot of trees on the street all behind the trees and all the way down around the corner and I thought surely that's not the open home and lo and behold it was so it was very hot that day it was so hot it was scorching and so I thought the first thing I thought was I'll go to the supermarket and um, get some water for these people. And so I went down to the supermarket, came back, and uh, we, we had to park all the way down the other block and walk with this water. And we went in, and um, I could not believe it, the amount of people that turned up on Sunday. 
Um, after they, uh, I handed all the water out and put some in the house, and after they all left, the amount of people that turned up on that Sunday was 150 people. We could not believe it. Neighbours came up to Mark later and said, what did you do? We have never seen that many people at an open home. Like, we've lived here for years and we've never seen that many people. What did you do? Um, and this kept on going. I think the, the biggest number he had was about 180. Um, and we just, it just kept on, the blessing just kept on coming every Sunday and everywhere he went. The neighbours would come and say, what do you do? Because we want you to sell our home. Um, what do you do that's different? And Mark and I knew what was different. We kept, we kept God's day. We kept it holy and we put him first. And um, we just had that leap of faith. And we left it up to God. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, children, that song that you sing, what a happy place. I mean, what, no, it wasn't happy place. Happiness is, thank you. If you're my vintage, you will know back in the early 70s, sir, early 80s, there was a movie made and that was the theme song, Happiness Is. And if you will go online to YouTube, it's still there. <laughs> so you, if you want to watch the movie and hear that song, go to YouTube, Happiness Is, to know the Savior. Okay, let's sing our two favorite songs. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan will have to flee. Who can tell what God can do? Who can tell his love for you? In the name of Jesus only, we have the victory. Do we? Yes, just the name of Jesus. And let's sing the other one. What a happy place. This world, would be this world would be if everyone, if everyone would, faithfully would faithfully try out this plan in all sincerity and always do to others as you would that others should do unto you. There would be no more sorrow or trouble anywhere. There would be no more children living in despair. What a happy place this world would be if everyone would faithfully try out this plan in all sincerity. And always do to others as you would that others should do unto you. We're going to live in a world like that very soon. And that world begins here. If this, if this family can be that world, what a powerful impact that you will have in this community. Just living with that attitude. Because the exponential influence of, if we were to take everyone here, and let me give an illustration. <clears throat> You're driving to work. And there's a car wanting to get into the traffic, and so you just stop. Let the, tra the car pull in. How does that person feel when you did that? They feel important, don't they? Significant. You stop, you let them in. What do you think they're going to do down the street when someone else wants to pull in? Now, when that person stops and lets someone else pull in, how are they going to feel? <laughs> okay, you've started something, and by the end of that day, how many people have been influenced? 
Okay? Because what you were doing here, the significance of that act is at that particular moment when you stop and you let that car pull in and they feel the appreciation and significance, you have created the perfect moment for the Holy Spirit to speak into their life. You see, it's not our work. We just create the opportunities for God to work. That's all we do. And so we're always raising the bar. We're just showing so much you are significant. You are important. It may be with a smile. It may be with stopping your car. Whatever it is that the Holy Spirit prompts you to do is creating moments, moments, moments that just go on like a pebble effect, a ripple effect. And so that's, that is what ministry is. <laughs> it's not something you do. It's what you are. And it's how you live in each moment, allowing the Holy Spirit to prompt you to create those moments for the Holy Spirit to speak into a life. And if this church, if every one of you are willing to be available, God will work in you and through you to create those moments. And then one day, one day, whenever the Lord comes, sooner than we think, not as soon as we may desire, but sooner than we think. God is going to introduce you to people who were saved by a smile. <laughs> who were saved by a moment of kindness, of thoughtfulness that you created. That's how simple it is. Because remember, we're all in a process where God is moving people. Every little encounter, every little moment of that experience is moving a person toward the reception of God into their life. So it's not one big grand event that happens. It's those little moments that multiply and multiply until they reach that critical mass. And then something happens that leads them across the line. And they finally make that decision to give their heart to the Lord. So this week we've been exploring the covenant that God made with his people when he called them out of Israel. Last Sabbath, we mentioned to you that God started with a man, Abraham. He next went to a family, Jacob. He then went to a nation, Israel. And last, he went to the Seventh-day Adventist. We are the last. We're the international. There was an fam individual, a family, a nation, and now a world. And we are the privileged to take this gospel, this good news, to the world. And the gospel is that you're free. You're free. That means that you have the freedom to choose the life and the destiny of your choice. You can choose to be miserable. You can choose to live in defeat. You can live with failure. Or you can live with the joy of the Lord. You can be half full or you can overflow. What do you want? You're free. The gospel says you are free to choose the life that you want. Now, God offers you the fullness of joy. And the, what we've been looking at this week is the covenant that God made that guarantees the life that he offers you. It's not something that you can achieve. It's something that's already yours. You're not working from victory. You're not working to victory. You're working from victory. Jesus has already lived your life. He's died your death. He is resurrected. And so you have every guarantee of living a fulfilled, successful, perfect life. You see, perfect is complete. I do not say that I am perfect. But I can say I am perfectly his. I do not say I am perfect, but I can say with absolute confidence, I have a perfect savior. That's the perfection that scripture offers because it's all by faith. It's already been done for me. But as we've also emphasized this week, that the judgment, the, our message to the world is that a judgment is coming and God is going to award us according to our choices, not according to our good and bad deeds. It's based upon our choices. And so God must have the evidence in his ledger book that he has the right to save you because the devil also knows every temptation, every sin that you fell for. He knows that. 
But God has a ledger that records every time that you have allowed him access into your heart, into your life. Every time you've allowed the Holy Spirit to work in you and through you to create those ideal moments, those opportunities for the Holy Spirit to speak into people's lives. God must have the evidence to prove that you made the choice. You made the decision. And so we've been looking at this covenant that God has created today. We're at the very last one. And so if you open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. It says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Now that sounds very much like the second commandment, doesn't it? <laughs> thou shalt have no other gods before me, because that's what it's all about. So why do we have the second commandment and then we have the last commandment? It's simply because in the first commandment, we're dealing with our relationship with God. And, this, and the last commandment, we're dealing with our relationship with things around us. God doesn't want us to be disappointed because if you worship any other God, is there any other God? <laughs> There's illusions, but is there any other God? We refer to God as the one who has created all things and sustains life. That's God. Okay. Is there any other God? No. To worship anything else to, is to simply create, to worship an illusion. And so in the last six is our relationship to man, to each other. And we are not to worship other people. We're not to worship other things because God says you're guaranteed to be disappointed. Because no, no person, no thing can ever fulfill you. And fulfillment simply means life. That's what fulfillment is. You have the fullness of life, the fullness of joy. Can anyone give you life? No. Only God can give you life. And God says, don't go anywhere else because you're not going to find it anywhere else. If you come to me, you'll never be disappointed. And God wants us to be fulfilled in every area of our life. But the devil is a master. He convinced Eve here in a perfect world, here on this planet, in a perfect world that God had created. And in that garden, at that tree of knowledge of good and evil, he convinced Eve that there was something more that she could have. And that's what the devil works on. You need something more. You're not what you have is not enough. You need, you need more. <laughs> Isn't that why they sell iPhones and get to have a new one every, every year? <laughs> I mean, even sometimes they probably come out with more than once a year. But you're, you're never satisfied because you need something more. Something different. Something better. Something more fulfilling. And so the devil convinced Eve that you need something more. And the devil's been playing that game ever since. That somehow... Once we have been infected with sin, it has created a mindset that is the same thing that Eve fell for in the Garden of Eden. That there is something more. And it looks good. I mean, when that serpent picked that piece of fruit and took a bite of that fruit, and I'm sure that it had a fragrance also. Heaven, you know, fruit in heaven, everything in heaven is going to be far more than we have here. So it's not only the look, it's not only that dripping juice, but this fragrance of that fruit said, wow, never seen anything like that. Never smelt anything like that before. And we fall for it. But even though this text says thou shalt not covet why is it that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 31, turn with me there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 31, it says, but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So God says in, in the commandment says thou shalt not covet 
and yet here it says covet more. So covet is not a bad term. Covenant simply means to wish for, to desire earnestly, to have warm feelings. So God says, if you covet a man's house, a man's wife, a man's manservant, maidservant, whatever, anything that someone else has, if you covet that, you're going to be disappointed because it's, it's, it's self-destructive. It's going to lead to death. Why? Why does God tell us not to covet what man has? Because God says you already have it. <laughs> when you have me, you have everything because I am the one that makes everything. I've made everything. That's why he says, come to me and ask. Ask, and I will give you everything you desire. Desire, yes, when I put the desire in your heart, I want to fulfill it. And so God says, just come to me and I will fulfill you. But it will disappoint you if you seek it yourself. And I've shared with you and others have shared this week how that when times that we have pursued what we think, we get disappointed. But when we finally throw up our hands and say, God, I'm over. I'm through. I am not going to try and solve this problem. I'm going to let you solve it. I don't know, how to, I don't know how to, what to choose. I don't know where, what direction to go. God says, good, now I can work with you. So in any situation of our life, God is saying, I'm, I, just, I want you to come to me. Give me the problem. Give me the issue that you're trying to solve. And let me solve it. And any of you who have ever done that, you know that God has a better solution than you will ever think of yourself. He has a better way of solving every problem. If you're looking for the right partner in your life, young people, don't go looking. That's the wrong approach. God says, you build a relationship with me. You build a relationship with me because it takes three to make a marriage. It takes three to make a marriage. God and a man and a woman. God says, if you will leave that to me, I will find the right person for you because I'm already working on that. I already put it in your heart for a desire, so I want to fulfill it. But if you try and do it yourself, you'll likely mess it up. You will never choose, you will never choose the partner that I would choose for you. So we leave it to God. If you're looking for a job, if, if whatever you're doing, if you will just say, God, many of you are looking for homes in the country. I've shared with you this week my experience. All you have to do is say, God, I'm ready to move. I don't have to sell my house. I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is say, God, I'm ready. I'm ready. Now you're going to have to show me what to do, prompt me where to go, where to look, whatever. And it's going to be in your time, God. Mine took nine years. <laughs> you may want to find yours in a week. Well, it didn't work for that way for me. Nine years. But God worked and he brought us and gave us a home that was far more and I'm not talking about elaborate I'm talking about the whole package we live in a beautiful place up on a ridge all we can we can see like an airplane for miles in the distance and all we see is forest and quietness and beauty a lovely place to live I would have never chosen I wouldn't even know it existed but God brought us there so the point I'm making is God says if you will trust me I will give you more than your heart desires. Because whenever you get to heaven, you're going to say, Lord, why did I ever want anything on this earth? Why did I ever think that was valuable when you had so much more to give me? God says, yeah, just trust me. Just trust me. Now, don't be like that fellow I just shared in first service this morning. He, he was very selfish. But he, he went to church. He did all the right things. And uh, he was expecting to go to heaven and... You understand, I'm just using an illustration. This is not theologically correct. <laughs> he gets to heaven. And he's expecting to find this beautiful mansion. Because he had lived very well on this earth. He had a beautiful house, car, everything very nice. Everything was beautiful. And he was expecting to find the same in heaven. And so he gets there and St. Peter's taking him, walking him through the community. And he's thinking, any moment, because these were just gorgeous mansions. They were beautiful places. And he's thinking, any time they're going to stop in one, in front, front of one of these. And he's going to say, 
Fred, that's yours. Well, they walked and they walked. And the houses got smaller and they got smaller and they got smaller. And you know what a tiny house is? <laughs> they stopped in front of a tiny house. And St. Peter said, Fred, this is yours. He said, how can that be? How can that be? He said, well, you know, you never ever sent us much to work with. <laughs> hmm. Never sent us much to work with. So... God wants to give you more than your heart's desire. So he says, don't covet. But then when we come to 1 Corinthians 12, we just read, but covet earnestly the best gifts. You see, the devil tempts us as he did with Jesus in the wilderness. He tempts us with physical things. He tempts us with what we can see and we think that's tangible, that's real. And God says, no, the real things you can't see. And those are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. You can't see those things, but those are the things, the very elements that make life worth living. Because without it, there's no joy. So God says you've got to get it straight. If you think things are going to give you life and really fulfill you, you're, you're destined to be disappointed. Because you won't find it there. So recognize that the things that you can't see are more real than the things that you can't see. And so that's why in chapter 13, what does it say here? Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, verse 13 says, but I will show you a more excellent way. What does God want to do for us? He wants us to make us great lovers. Because life is all about love. What if there was not any love in this world? Would you want to live here? Be a miserable place. That's where, the, that's where all the evil angels live. Can you imagine the misery and the fighting and the bickering that goes on among the evil angels? Do you think they're happy? Do you think there's any sort of agreement among them? Absolutely not. It's hell. They live in hell. There's no agreement among them because God is not there. And so God says, I want, you to, I want to make you a Seventh-day Adventist. Remember, we are the last generation. We are the ones that are called to give the final message to the world that Jesus is going to bring all this sin and suffering to an end. And there is an eternity of perfect joy and fulfillment and blessing in the world to come right here on this planet. So you and I cannot give that message unless we are living the message. And God says, I will guarantee that the message will be cloud and clear if you will allow me access to every moment of your life. And as I've shared with you this morning, when you get out of bed, you get out of bed on your knees and you say, God, I am available. I know you've got an excited day planned for me and I'm looking forward to it. But I'm waiting on you. You're going to open the doors. You're going to create opportunities. For what? For you and I to love other people. We're going to raise the bar. We're going to people, treat people not as they are, but as God sees them. Because now God is living in us and through us. And so we see through his eyes. We feel with his heart. We understand that. And so you and I are raising the bar all day long. Now, that's the gospel. That's ministry. If you think you want to be involved in more ministry in the church, just be more available to God and let him do it. And he's going to create those opportunities, I can tell you. I sat in the barber chair on Thursday. And this young lady covered from her neck all the way down in tattoos. Colby. Kobe. Lovely young girl. And we were able to talk about her life and her desires and her ambitions and her purpose in life. And uh, yeah, just raise the bar. Just raise the bar. What an opportunity was created to ask her about her relationship with God. She wasn't offended. 
Because why? Because God put me there in that barber chair for Colby to let her know that she was important to God. And how did I do that? I simply shared my story. God is great. God is good. And you and I are experiencing those every day. So God says, I want to make you a generation of lovers. Now, how do we allow that? And let's take that sheet that you have in front of you and let's follow through in this. If we fall for the devil's temptations, by the way, remember back... Now, I know I'm giving my age away here. Uh, In 1971 was the first time Coca-Cola came out with a song. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Any of you remember that one? Eh? You don't remember that one? Obviously, you weren't born then, were you? (laughs) I can remember it very well. And the second line goes, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. (laughs) You see, the devil stole God's song. (laughs) How do we know the devil stole it? It's because how does it end? I'd like to buy the world a Coke. (laughs) As if everything is going to be fulfilled in a Coke. That's how you can find happiness. You're going to find love. You're going to find it. But God is saying to you and I, he wants us to sing this song, I'd like, to, I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Isn't that what God wants to do? Yes. That's our song. That is our song. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. We're all on the same page, singing the same note. And God is calling us into that, but only he can make it happen. It's not something we can do of ourselves. And so let's look at the ways in which the devil has deceived people and he's deceiving them every day because the world, all mass media, if you go on the internet, if you go on the, in the television, radio, what are they trying to do? Who are, the, who are behind everything that happens? It's a sponsor, isn't it not? And they want to sell you something. And so they've got to convince you that you need what we have. You need what we have. I don't care if you have one, you need another one. <laughs> You need a new model. Always appealing to something more. But God wants you to know that when you have him, when you have love in your life, you have everything that matters in life. So what's the first one? Worry. Do not worry. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? God says, I don't want you to worry. I want any of my children to worry because I'll take care of you. And we're told that worry is the sin in the Christian church. It's the sin. Worry. What is worry? It's simply that I am concerned about how I'm going to solve my problems. I don't know a solution. I'm not, I'm not sure how we're going to solve this, how we're going to pay our bills, how I'm going to handle this or that or the other thing. I'm, I'm concerned. And what happens when you worry? You actually you actually lower your whole immune system. If you want to get sick, just worry. Take responsibility for everything yourself. And you'll lower your immune system. People say, I don't know why I'm sick. Well, it's quite easy to tell you why you're sick. Because you're trying to live life on your own strength. Without trusting in God. Because God says, brethren, I wish above all things that you would prosper. Three things. Prosper and be in health even as you're soul prospers that's God's desire for us but if we worry we're going to lower our immune system and we cannot focus it puts everything out of focus because what am I thinking about now I'm not thinking about saying Lord thank you thank you thank you I'm saying oh me oh me number two (laughs) by the way number two fatigue it says do not wear yourself out to be rich have the wisdom to show restraint. Now Tolstoy, and if any of you read any of Tolstoy, he tells a story of a man who was given the opportunity to claim land. However much land he could walk around in a day, 
He had to be back by sunset, but however much land he could circumvent in a day, that would be his. And so he's out there. He is running. He is pushing himself, pushing himself, and he's covering as much. He's figured it out already he, that he can cover this much territory. And finally, as the sun is about to set, he comes back and dies from overexhaustion. That's what life is like here. We're so busy trying to claim all of this stuff that it kills us. How many marriages, how many businesses, how many you know, relationships have been destroyed over embezzlement, over cheating, over lying? You know, people will do anything to get money. Do you believe that? Yeah. They'll lie, they cheat, they commit adultery, they'll do anything to get money because they think that that is what security and wealth is. But the Lord says, don't wear yourself out. Have you known of anyone that's ever taken it with them? I don't know of anyone. You're going to leave it. It's worth nothing because you already have it. Number three is depression. Some men in the strength struggle to be rich have lost their faith and caused themselves untold agonies of the mind. That's God's word. Their struggle to be rich have lost their faith and caused themselves untold agonies of the mind. That's depression. Depression. The next one. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Problems is the fourth one. We have problems. Abraham Lincoln's walking down the street one day. And two of his sons, little sons, were walking beside him. And they were just squabbling away. They were crying. They were in a miserable mess. And someone stopped him and asked him what the problem was. And he said, ah. He said, I have three walnuts in my pocket. And they both want two. Weren't happy. Both wanted two. And there's only three there. They couldn't have it. They couldn't share it. And so they were so upset because they couldn't have what they wanted. Because they wanted, they want, didn't want it. They didn't want to share with the other one. So we create all kind of problems. So how do we learn to be content? How do we learn to be content? Number one, be grateful and enjoy what you have. What does it say? Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and will take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, be content with that. God says, learn to be content. Don't look at what someone else has and think, well, I need one of those too. God says, be happy with what you have. Because why? Because we're only strangers passing through. God says, if the more comfortable you try to make yourself here, the less you want there. Because you're happy, you're content, I've got it all, I'm, I'm happy with that. God says, no, I don't want you to be happy here. I have to stir you up and I have to take things from you to remind you that things will never satisfy. And they will distract and they will make you comfortable here and you're going to miss out on the world to come. And one day you're going to look at that earth made new. When all of those billions of people, they say about 65 billion people have lived upon our planet in the history of this world. And the majority of those are going to come up and they're going to look at that city. They're going to smell the fragrance. They're going to hear the music. They're going to, hear, they're going to see sights that they have never imagined before. And every one of them will immediately recall that we are told the opportunities they had of accepting the gift and they had rejected it. They will not be blaming anybody else. They will know for themselves that they chose to miss out. 
Do you want to be among those? Which side of the fence, which side of the wall do you want to be on? You and I are choosing that every day. So we come to the word of God, not based upon what we think or what other people are doing. We say, Lord, what is your standard? God says, don't covet. Don't look over the fence. Be content with such as you have. For this is godliness with great gain. Doesn't mean God says you have to be poor. God says, no, I want to bless you. But I don't ever want you to hold on to what you have and think that that's your security. Because I gave it to you. It's not yours. I gave it to you. It's mine. And as we discussed previously, the greatest theft that is perpetrated in the church is that our body is God's temple. And we think it's ours. I can do what I want. I can put anything into it. In my ears, in my mouth, in my eyes. I can do whatever I want to it. Oh, yes. Do you know what we do? We take the moral law, and if anyone breaks the moral law, we say, oh, he is a sinner. But if we break the natural law, which is an which is a inseparable part of the moral law, and we break that, and what do we say? Oh, he's just sick. Isn't that amazing? That's sin. It's the same law. But we look at the other side and we say, oh, he's just sick. Why? Because we like, we like to eat what we want to eat, drink what we want to drink, do with our body what we want to do with it, and say, it's mine. God says, no, it's not. You're dealing with my property. And I'm going to hold you accountable one day for that. I'm going to hold you accountable. Because you see, in my ledger book in heaven, I have to prove that you have not only given me your soul, your mind, your heart, but you've given me your body because that's mine too. God says, I gave you my son. And when he came to this earth, did he live life perfectly? In the strength that I offer you. Because Jesus had no advantage that you and I don't have. The same Holy Spirit lived the life in Jesus that he is willing to live in you and I. The same life. Was he ever sick? Was Jesus ever sick? No. Now, I'm not, not, that's not a castigation or a condemnation of you. <clears throat> but Jesus was never sick. And there's so many passages in scriptures that assure us that God wants us to be in health. Brethren, I wish above all things that I was prosperous, as what I just said. And be in health even as your soul prospers. God wants us to be a healthy specimen to the world. That God not only gives us a assurance of salvation. But he gives us a healthy body. Because how healthy your body is determines how healthy spiritually you are. You cannot be strong spiritually if you're not strong physically. And God is preparing a generation of people to stand through a crisis that the world has never, ever experienced before. God is telling us that. All the past generations, all the persecution, all the torture and trouble that people have encountered who have dared to take a stand for God is nothing compared to what is coming. Now, we're not going to stand in our own strength. We will stand in the strength of God. He is our strength, our defense. But we will face it, and God is preparing this generation. And as I mentioned last week, and I'm going to mention it again, is that when God gave us the Ten Commandments, God gives us the covenant, the assurance of salvation. God has given us His Word as a source of authority. But God has called us as pastors, as leaders, as teachers of the flock, that we do not come just as a pastor. We come as Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the other prophets with the same authority, not ourselves. But what do you read in Revelation 12, 17? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have what? Testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? Revelation 19.10. The spirit of prophecy. Why has God given that to us? Because all through the Old Testament, any time there was trouble in Israel, God raised up a prophet to bring the people back into a relationship with God. 
But now in the last generation, God has sent that same gift to the church. Why? What for the purpose? Because it is to prepare us. You see, the Bible itself gives us the broad outline, the clear outline of the moral law. But God has given the spirit of prophecy to the last generation specifically for the natural law. That's where you find all those fine details and instructions regarding health. It is there. And if we disregard that, then we are not. You can't call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist. Do you know that? You can't say, oh, Ellen White, Ellen White. It's not Ellen White. It's God. Either God inspired it or he didn't. I'm convinced he did. I have been blessed by it. As a child growing up, my parents didn't give me toys. They gave me books. And by the time I was 20 years of age, I had read every one of the spirit of prophecy. And I was blessed, blessed to have parents who saw the insight and the importance of being acquainted with the instruction that God has given. And so I hold up to you today, folks. God has given us wisdom and counsel in the spirit of prophecy that he may have a people who are totally his morally and physically. He wants you to be a specimen to the world. Why? Because the time is coming when if you are not strong physically and morally, spiritually, you will not stand. You may think you can stand, but the pressure is not on today. But when the pressure is on, that's when it, the revelation comes of where you really stand with God. So that's my little blurb on the testimony of Jesus and the, I should should say the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. That's why God has given it, because there is a special preparation for this last generation. If you want to be a part of God's kingdom, then you need to take it seriously. Okay. Be grateful and enjoy what you have. Number two is don't compare yourself with others. Don't compare yourself to others. You're unique. Don't try and be like someone else. You'll only disappoint yourself. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, with some who compare themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves they are not wise. We don't compare ourselves with ourselves. We compare ourselves with the word of God. Because if you compare yourself with yourself, you say, well, I'm pretty good. Look at all the other people around me. I'm as good as they are. God says, don't do that. Don't compare yourself with your, yourself. Compare yourself with my son. That's the standard. Number three is recognize the limitations to wealth. Ecclesiastes 9. It says, he who loves money shall never have enough. The foolishness of thinking that wealth brings happiness. The more you have, the more you spend right up to the limits of your income. Recognize the limitations of wealth. You will never have enough. You will never have enough. 40% of all Australians are spending more every week than they earn. 40%. The average debt on credit cards is $8,000. People are trying to cover and they're borrowing and it's going to collapse you're always under pressure number four is focus on relationships better to be poor and reverence the Lord than to be rich and in trouble better to eat vegetables with people you love than to eat the finest meat where there's hate focus on relationships Love is only spelt in time. That's why God gave us the Sabbath. God says, I love you. And so he gave us the Sabbath as time to be with us. That's what the Sabbath is all about. It's the gift of God himself. And so whenever you're chasing money, whenever you're chasing wealth, it's exhausting. And by the way, remember that the more you chase money, the faster it runs. You'll never catch it. It will always outrun you. Guaranteed, it will outrun you. Ask anyone who's ever chased money and you'll find out the truth. And I'm the first example I'll tell you. I'll swear to it. It's true. <laughs> I've never caught it yet. 
It's always outrun me. God says, let me give you the wealth. Let me do that. Slow and steady and sure. And I will increase it. Number five, look beyond wants. I should say, look beyond what's temporary. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18, it says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's what we've talked about previously. All those great, the greatest values and assets we have is the love, joy, peace. You can't buy that. God says, focus on that. If you have that, as we read in the previous text, it, it's better to be poor. It's better to be poor and reverence the Lord than to be rich and in trouble. Be content with what you have. Because are you poor? I and mean, we're going to look around us and compare ourselves with everyone else and say, oh, look what, look what those people have. Look what those people have. But are you poor? Remember, it's the unseen that is the true wealth. The unseen is the true wealth. Do you have a home in heaven? Well, if God is true, then we have it. It's there. It's ready. The table is ready down by the river of life, under the tree of life. It's all there. It's for real. Jesus is real. He came, he went, and he said he's coming again. And he has a place for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should have eternal life. Did I tell you the story last night of the lady who had that dream? Did I tell you that last night? Yeah. For those of you who weren't here, the Holy Spirit is doing an incredible work in our world. As we know in the Muslim world, the man in white is showing up. That's how they describe him. He's the man in white is showing up. Jesus is showing up. Well, this particular story, some of you have, made, have seen it on the internet, was of the story of a Jewish lady raised in a Jewish community in New York City. And all of her relatives lived around. And she was Jewish. Absolutely through and through Jewish. And every Friday night, all the families would get together and have this great meal together. If any of you have ever been to Jerusalem and spent time with a family, a Jewish family, and gone through the ritual, it is just incredible. It's beautiful. Anyway, one day her mother's driving, and for some reason, a drunk gets in front of her. She swerves. She runs into a brick wall and almost dead. In the hospital, the doctors discover that she has cancer, and within a short time, she's dead. Now, this young lady, her mother was the center of her life. She was the most caring, loving, generous, extravagantly caring and loving person. And when her mother was gone, she gave up on God. If that's what life is, is that what God can do? She just gave up. She says sex, rock and roll and drugs was all that she was interested in. Well, you know where life is going to go when, when you're immersed in that. It went down. And one day, somewhere along the line, she had made contact with an ad, not an Adventist, but with a Christian pastor. And he told her that uh, she just needed, he said, do you know how to pray? She said, of course, I'm Jewish. He said, well, you need to pray. Talk to God, speak to God, and let him tell you what to do. So she did. And that night, she woke up. And here was this bright being in a room. And she immediately recognized it as Jesus. She had never had anything to do with, just, with Jesus. And her first thought was, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm Jewish. And he said, so am I. <laughs> hmm. He said, I love you. I love you. And he said, look at all those lights. All over the city, she had an apartment way up in an apartment building. And she could look out over the city and see all the lights of New York City. And he said, all those lights represent people. He said, what if all those lights went out? And you are the only light that's left. He said, I would have died for you. I would have died for you. Well, her life was changed, completely changed. 
And of course, as a result of that, her family rejected her. Her brother, she went and told her brother that she had given her heart to the Lord. And he just became furious, kicked her out of the house, said, I never want to see you again. I don't want anything to do with you. And so her life was forever changed. But as a bit of encouragement, the wife of her brother, her sister-in-law, followed her out to the car. And she said, I believe you. <laughs> Just be patient with your brother. And I think you'll come around one day. So, folks, you and I are the light of the world. Jesus would have died for any one of us, and he did. He is coming again. He wants us to have our priorities straight. Are they straight? Have you made that choice, that decision? Have you decided where you're going to spend eternity? And have you decided how you're going to spend today? Is it Jesus? Is it him that's going to be in control of your life? Can he fill you, your life to overflowing with the blessing that he wants to use? Because we are called to give the message. But it's not a verbal message. You see, it's you and I are the light. As the world observes how we live, it is having an influence that is incalculable to you. Because you can't imagine what influence you're having. You don't know who you're influencing. But it's having an influence. I remember distinctly sitting in front of a, a pizza parlor one night. My wife was in the uh, supermarket just on the other side. And this couple walks in, two children, and I just observe them. And the husband and wife are standing there holding hands, and she's leaning up against them, and the children are over, and they're, you could just see they loved each other. You could see the love and the way they spoke to their children and the way they related to each other. Now, they didn't have a clue I was watching, but I was. And what did my heart say? I want to be like that. I want to be that kind of lover. I want to be that kind of husband. I want to have that kind of family. You see, you don't know who you are influencing. But if you have this connection with God that you choose every day and all through the day, you are having an almost irresistible influence wherever you go. And so I just want to say to each one of you, decide where you're going to spend eternity. Jesus is coming. He is coming. He is preparing a people. To live in an indescribable world of joy and happiness and love that will never end. It's our choice. But it's up to you. God has made his decision. Now, it's your decision. I pray that I will see you there.